Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with a very special edition of the Watchman Video Broadcast. We're going to be talking about something that a few years ago I had never heard of. In fact, probably you might be watching this video and have never heard of this, but I can say, and by the time we get done with this video presentation, I hope that you'll see what I'm talking about I can say that this is probably one of the most dangerous, deadly things that is moving into the church right now. And I'm talking about what used to be good, decent, Bible-believing, fundamental churches. This is the most dangerous thing that is moving in right now. It is the issue of what is called contemplative prayer. Now, as we go through this video presentation, I'll explain more about what that is and sort of describe it in detail your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be absolutely amazed at what is going on inside what used to be fundamental Bible-believing churches all across this world, but especially right here in the United States of America. You know, I talk about all the time, I talk about how I believe in conspiracies. I believe in conspiracy theories. I believe in things that are related, conspiracies that are related to what's in the Bible. I believe the Bible is going to explain all of these little ideas and notions that are going on behind the scenes that nobody should know anything about, and yet the Bible is going to reveal them, and several places come to mind. But I want you to notice this first verse here, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now I want you to notice that this verse is not telling us that when they depart from the faith that they're just going to become atheist, agnostic, or not care about God at all. They're going to depart from the faith and they're going to give heed. They're going to change from what they used to believe in, which was the Bible. They're going to change over to what is being told them by seducing spirits. Spirits that seduce people and doctrines of devils. And I'm going to explain this verse as sort of the key to what we're going to uncover in this video presentation. But I want us to go back to the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, and I want you to see a warning that God gave to the Israelites. I believe that warning still applies to us today who call ourselves Christians, who pastor churches, who are part of denominations, who are part of the effort to preach the gospel. I believe that warning still applies to us. It's a warning about separation, letting us know that the people that are out there are not like the people that are God's people. They should be separate. And he's warning us about them and about their ways, lest we become like them. And I want you to notice what he says. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people." I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Now notice what God is warning the Israelites, that if they become, if they become like the strangers in the land that they met, if they become like the wicked generation that God told them not to be, God said, I'm going to provoke you to anger with a people that is not a nation. Now historically, historically we can see the idea that Israel, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was provoked to jealousy and is being provoked to jealousy right now by God saving the Gentile nations. That's you and I, folks. And so we are the ones who are going to be the agents of provocation to provoke Israel to jealousy because God said, I'm done with you and I'm going to move in the Gentile people for a time being. Now notice what he says in verse 32 of the same chapter. Look at what God said. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. Now I want to stop right here. Remember what Jesus told us. Jesus said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. So Jesus is describing the relationship that exists between Christ and his church in that number one, he is the husband and we are the, we are the bride. He is the vine 
and we are the branches. So God is telling the Israelites, here, here's what's going to happen now. You're going to follow all these wicked people, and you're going to follow, listen to this, you're going to follow their practices. And what's going to happen is, I'm not going to be your vine anymore. Sodom is going to be your vine. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine, look at the word here, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. That's a snake. Later on in, in this presentation, we're going to look at this wine issue. We're going to look at contrasts in the Bible. Good wine, new wine, which is the Holy Spirit, which doesn't make you drunk. And old wine, which does make you drunk. And we're not just talking about, you know, something you drink. We're talking about spiritual wine. And notice what he said. He said, their wine is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of asp. So I want you to get this. Dragons and snakes. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about that old dragon, the serpent, the devil, Lucifer himself being the vine that I believe churches are moving into right now. And it's all being done through the idea of contemplative prayer. Uh, not too long ago, a publication from the Free Will Baptist came out called One Magazine. They featured an article by Stan Toller, who is one of the leaders in the Nazarene movement. Now, I will tell you that among Christian denominations in this country, the Nazarenes seem to be taking a charge. Now, I'm not against good Nazarene people, and there are some wonderful people out there that are fighting this in their denomination. But the denomination itself, by and large, has been taken over by this move of what they call spiritual formation or contemplative prayer. In fact, Stan Toller, who was one of the leaders of the Nazarene denomination, wrote in this Free Will Baptist article, he introduced the idea of spiritual formation ministries. Now, spiritual formation, and we're going to look at some terms that go along with contemplative prayer. In case you've never heard of contemplative prayer, there might be another term that you've heard, that you've seen advertised, that a pastor talked about at a church you went to, that all of a sudden now it's going to make sense. And you're going to realize, hopefully, the danger that we are in. Spiritual formation is one of those ideas that is linked with contemplative prayer because when they start talking about spiritual formation, they're talking about a program to get contemplative prayer into the church, into the youth group, into the ministry, into the Bible college, into the Bible camp that kids go to. That's what spiritual formation. So here it is, one of these leaders among the contemplative prayer movement that every year the, the Nazarene denomination, along with their annual yearly meeting that they have, this big meeting of all the churches getting together, they also have on the sideline a spiritual formation retreat. And the links of this retreat to New Age practices is, is absolutely mind-boggling. So when I see this phrase, this concept, spiritual formation, being introduced probably for the very first time in the minds of pastors and church members across the country, I realize that it won't be too long before the idea of contemplative prayer is introduced. Now, somebody, we're going to start defining contemplative prayer. We're going to kind of look at what it is and how it came about. We're going to see the roots of contemplative prayer and we're going to discern and understand where it's leading to, and we're all going to do that. Look at this first slide here. In the 1970s, three mystic Roman Catholic monks, Father William Menninger, Father Basil Pennington, and Abbot Thomas Keating, who is a head monk, labeled centering prayer as, quote, a method of prayer which prepares us to receive the gift of God's presence, traditionally called contemplative prayer. It is, quote, the opening of the mind and heart, our whole being to God, whom we know by faith is within us. Contemplative prayer is a prayer of silence and experience of God's presence. This method of prayer is a movement beyond conversation with Christ to communion with Him. The source of centering prayer, as in all methods leading to contemplative prayer, is the indwelling Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
It is also inspired by writings of major contributors to the con Christian contemplative heritage, including John Cassian, the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing, Francis de Sales, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Teresa of Lisieux, and Thomas Merton. Now, if you've never heard of any of these names, it's probably because you're not Roman Catholic. Most, in fact, we're going to see this later on, most of the ideas and concepts concerning spiritual formation, centering prayer, contemplative prayer, and all of this, they all came from one source. And we're going to see that source as we move through this thing. But here we're just laying a foundation of what they say contemplative prayer is. Now, I hope you've caught this already. The biblical concept of prayer is asking. When we pray to God, we ask God for things. Paul talked about uh, offering prayers and supplications, giving our requests to God. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. When we pray to God, we're supposed to ask God for things. That's what that's how the Bible defines prayer. But they're going to take it another step. They're going to say that this form of prayer is not about saying anything to God. It's about getting into a place in our mind. And I'm going to show you this, what this is. Getting into a place in our mind where we now can hear from God. So here's what I want to warn you about. When you start hearing pastors or seminar givers or reading Christian books that, that talk, they, they want to identify prayer as, you know, prayer is not just us talking to God. It's being, it's God being allowed to talk back to us. I think that they're setting you up to practice contemplative prayer. And I'm going to show you from the Bible that there is one true source that you know for a fact that you're hearing from God. And we're going to see that verse here in just a little bit. Here is contemplative prayer defined. It is particularly difficult to describe this type of prayer in writing, as it is best taught in person. In general, however, centering prayer works like this. Choose a word such as Jesus or Father, for example, as a focus for contemplative prayer. Repeat the word silently in your mind for a set amount of time, say 20 minutes, until your heart seems to be repeating the word by itself just as naturally and involuntarily as breathing. Now, several verses come to my mind when I read this. Number one, the fact that he is describing what, sent, uh, what contemplative prayer is, and he can't describe it in words, which basically means that what he's going to give you does not come from the word of God. Remember the disciples, they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, Teach us to pray. Now, you don't see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus said, okay, now sit down, go into a quiet room, empty your mind of everything, and repeat something. In fact, Jesus told us the contrary. He said, when you pray, do not use, listen to this, vain repetitions as the heathen do. He, Christ, our Lord, our chief apostle, specifically told us not to use vain repetitions. And yet now here is a, what is becoming one of the most commonly accepted pagan heathen practices in the Christian church today. And it is in direct violation with the word of God in that the only way to do this is to take a word and repeat it over and over and over again. That's the only way to do it. And so already we're finding out and discovering the unbiblical roots of contemplative prayer. Christian contemplative prayer is the opening of mind and heart, our whole being to God, the ultimate mystery. Now I want you to look at that phrase, the ultimate mystery, because we're going to focus on that here in a little bit. Beyond thoughts, words, and emotions, whom we know by faith is within us, closer than breathing, thinking, feeling, and choosing even closer than consciousness itself. The root of all prayer is interior silence. Though we think of prayer as thoughts or feelings expressed in words, this is only one expression. Contemplative prayer is a prayer of silence, an experience of God's presence as the ground in which our being is rooted, the source from whom our life emerges at every moment. Now here again, I hope you understand what's being taught here. We're not being taught scriptural methods of prayer. We're being taught something that is outside of the scripture. Now, earlier we mentioned all of these uh, Catholic guys like this father and this abbot and these nuns and how they all practiced it. 
And you have to understand their mind frame and their concept. They were taught in their seminaries and that they, taught, they teach in their churches that Christian truth doesn't just come from the Bible. It comes from whatever the Pope says. It comes from whatever church tradition says. And so this is how they get around this. To those who call themselves Bible-believing Christians, the Bible is the only source for our faith and our practice, including the practice of prayer. And so if I want to know how to pray, I go to the Scripture, and I can tell you that nowhere in the Scripture does it tell us to get into a quiet place, uh, close, op open our mind, I'm going to show you that in a minute, open our mind, empty out all of our thoughts, become this total void of nothing, where we think absolutely nothing, get into this interior silence, and all of a sudden we're going to hear God whispering on the inside of us. If it sounds scary to you, I'm telling you, it is. And we're going to see the exact source of this coming up in just a little bit. I mentioned earlier that you, although you may not have heard of contemplative prayer, here are some of the terms being used now. Look for this in literature. Look for it in Sunday school literature. Look for it in VBS literature. And I'm going to show you an example of that. Look for it in uh, books. Look for it in seminars or teachings or sermons. Listen to what's being taught out there. And this is from Lighthouse Trails Research. They have an excellent source on all this. You can go to their website. Things such as labyrinths which is like walking mazes, enneagrams, prayer stations, breath prayers, remember that phrase, Jesus candles, the Jesus prayer, Lectio Divina, Taze, palms up, palms down, yoga, we're going to talk about that, the silence, sacred space, ancient prayer practices, a thin place, divine mystery, spiritual direction, Ignatian contemplation, remember that name, contemplative, centering, centering prayer, prayer of the heart, dark night of the soul, practicing the presence, divine center, inner light, mantra, awareness of being, slow prayer, being in the present moment, beyond word, spiritual disciplines, spiritual formation. We're t these are some of the phrases that I want you to listen to. Pay make a list, go to their website and get this list and just keep it by you. And I promise you, most of the ministries that are out there now, current uh, radio ministries, TV ministries, big name churches, denominational leadership seminars, leadership training seminars, Sunday school literature, they're going to start slipping in, just like was in one magazine, they're going to start slipping in these concepts that are going to lead people, hopefully in their eyes, to what contemplative prayer really is. Now, I will tell you that contemplative prayer is not exclusive to their version of Christianity. It is in the New Age movement. In fact, in the New Age movement, you will see contemplative prayer defined as uh, the purpose of it is to enter into an altered state of consciousness in order to find one's true self, thus finding God. This true self relates to the belief that man is basically good. Proponents of contemplative prayer teach that all human beings have a divine center and that all, not just born-again believers, should practice contemplative prayer. And one of the things that we see about contemplative prayer is that it, it is universal in its, in its existence. In other words, not just Christians can practice contemplative prayer and not just born-again Christians can have God in them. All of a sudden now, some things that we've been seeing in this world are starting to make sense. How is it that some of these grand old church leaders that we call church leaders all of a sudden now are coming out and saying, well, you know, it's possible that God could be in Muslims or that God could be in Jews or that God could be in Buddhists. It's possible that there are many roads to God. How is it that they all of a sudden started espousing that belief and believing that? That's because the true secret behind, the true mystery behind contemplative prayer reveals that all roads do lead to the same God. It's just not the God who is God of heaven, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose son is Jesus Christ. It is the God of this world.
And that's how can we see this universalism now exploding in Christianity that maybe everybody can be saved. Maybe everybody has the divine light inside of them. And contemplative prayer just brings this out. You know, uh, when I was in Bible college, I heard a lot about what's called Gnosticism. And they say Gnosticism believes that there is a divine spark inside of every man. And through the right practices, this spark can be brought to full-blown Godhood. That is the very nature of contemplative prayer. Centering prayer familiarizes us with God's first language, which is silence. Now, this is what's being taught amongst those who believe in contemplative prayer. That contemplative prayer basically is this prayer of silence and that God actually speaks in silence. That is totally contrary to the very nature of biblical Christianity in that biblical Christianity believes that God is identified taught, believe, revealed, not through silence, but through the exact opposite of silence, the Word of God. In fact, God showed to the prophet Amos a long time ago that there would come a time. He said in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I believe that God was revealing to Amos the times that we're living in right now when people, when people, rather than having the daily bread of the Word of God in their life, they're choosing the famine of silence of not hearing the words of God. They're actually choosing to hear a God that is silent rather than hearing a God that speaks through the pages of His Word. Contemplative prayer is further defined as a path of transformation. Contemplative consciousness, says Thomas Merton, is a transcultural, transreligious, transformed consciousness. It can shine through this or that system, religious or irreligious. Which basically means, here again, that contemplative prayer can be practiced by those who are Christians or those who are not Christians. Essentially saying, that anybody in the world through this religious practice that Jesus told us not to do can tap into the God that is within them. Folks, there's a setup in all of this and I'm gonna show you what this setup is as we move through this video. You're gonna see something that to me, I, here again I say this, the biggest danger moving into the Protestant church in America is through contemplative prayer. We mentioned Thomas Keating a while ago. He actually wrote a brochure. You can actually get this online at his website. Uh, it's called The Method of Centering Prayer, The Prayer of Consent by Thomas Ke Keating. Now I want you to notice that he's using this verse here, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Now, everybody that reads that verse would look at that and say, well, you know, that's God saying to us, be still and know that I am God. <sighs> I think to those who practice contemplative there and prayer and those who are promoting contemplative prayer, I think it has twisted itself in its meaning or is being twisted in, in its meaning is that they're telling you that you can say to yourself, be still and know that I am God. The very first thing that was promised by the devil to mankind was the concept that man could become God's, Genesis chapter three. This is the ultimate end of contemplative prayer, the union, now get this, I, I know that one of these days I wanna be united with God, but the clear message of Bible Christianity is that we are made one with God, made even with God, by way of the cross of Jesus Christ. For by grace are we saved through faith and not of works. And contemplative prayer is at its best works salvation. It's teaching men that if we perform the right ceremony, the right rituals, if we get our mind in the right place, if we, 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 we do this, then we'll be at one with God. And the whole message of the Bible is that we cannot do anything to be at one with God. Only Jesus can make us, can unite us with our Heavenly Father. Only Jesus and the cross of Jesus can do that. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of 
works, lest any man should boast. And so here, according to this, we can be one with God by this ritualistic mantra repeating practice called contemplative prayer. He says in this, he said, we may think of prayer as thoughts or feelings expressed in words, but this is only one expression. In the Christian tradition, contemplative prayer is considered to be the pure gift of God. It is the opening of mind and heart, our whole being to God, the ultimate mystery. And I mentioned that before, and I want you to see this, because now that he has mentioned the ultimate mystery, I want to show you something. We're going to look at a word in the Bible. That word mystery is in our Bible. And it's there 22 times. And the number 22 is the number for revelation in the Bible. And every time you see the word mystery in the Bible, it tells us who are Bible Christians that this mystery is revealed. Now, I'm going to contrast something right off to you. Here we have two concepts concerning God. One, that God is a revealed secret. And the other is that God is still a mystery. Everybody that promotes contemplative prayer and these prayer practices in the spiritual formation they're going, to, they're going to equate it with what's called Christian mysticism. The concept that God is still a mystery. But I want you to look at the scriptures. Mark chapter 4 verse 11. Here is the very first occurrence of the word mystery in the King James Bible. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. In other words, God said to you who believe the Bible and who trust me and trust my atonement and understand that the Bible is the word of God, not believe that God's in silence somewhere, you will understand and know and have revealed to you the mystery of the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 16, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And I submit to you that there is a group of people on this earth, Bible Christians, that God has charged them with the idea of revealing who God is to every nation of the earth, to everybody. Go ye into all the nations and preach the gospel, revealing the true nature of God. And I think there is a counter group in this world. There's certainly a lot more of them that are trying to conceal something by saying that God is a mystery. Now, I'm going to contrast one more thing for you in the scriptures concerning this mystery. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is, watch this, the mystery of godliness. And you'd say, see, God, godliness is a mystery. No, he's going to reveal to you what this mystery of godliness is. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Here it is. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The Bible is revealing to you the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness is that Jesus Christ, God, came down in the flesh. He was manifest in the flesh. The person of Jesus Christ is the revelation of the mystery of God itself, that God became a man. He became our high priest. He died a sacrificial atonement for us on the cross, and he ascended back into heaven as the faithful high priest who now is the mediator between God and men. Christ is the ultimate bridge between God and men, the mediator Jesus Christ. Now that is the mystery of godliness revealed. Then we see what's called the mystery of iniquity. And if Jesus was the revealed mystery of godliness, then another Jesus, the Antichrist, is the mystery of iniquity. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And any time we're talking about, any time you hear the mystics talk about mystery this and the mystery of God, then we understand what spirit is driving that mystery. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Revelation 17, 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. So now we have, you can either choose the mystery of godliness, which is revealed to us in the pages of the Bible, and be a Bible Christian, 
or you can choose Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the exact opposite of who God is. You can choose the Christian mysteries not revealed and be led into what's called Christian mysticism. Now, Christian mysticism is not just Christian. Mysticism exists in every other religion in the world. There is always a branch of those religions that deals specifically with mystery ideas, secret knowledge, elevated status, illumination, they call it. One source calls it a belief in or the pursuit in the unification with the one. That's a new age term for God or the Messiah or some other principle, the immediate consciousness of God or the direct experience of religious truth. Mysticism is nearly universal and unites most religions in the quest for divinity. Now, something that you will find as a common theme among those who practice mysticism or those who practice and promote contemplative prayer is the ecumenical nature of all of this. And what am I saying by using that word? I'm saying that there will come a point, and we know this to be true according to the scriptures, that all the earth's religions are going to combine and unite. And I'm here to tell you that contemplative prayer is what's going to unite all of these religions together. The article goes on to say, Catholicism, going back to its medieval mystical tradition, has a rich heritage of spirituality which it needs to recapture. But I'm interested in deep ecumenism. I think that the deeper you go into your own tradition in terms of spirituality, the closer you come to the living waters of wisdom. In this image, God is a great underground river. And I want you to notice that. God is a great underground river. There are many wells into this river. There's Buddhism, Taoism, Judaism, Sufism, the goddess, native traditions, and Christianity. Now, I'm gonna, I want you to remember this concept here of that God is a great underground river because I'm going, to, I'm going to show you what really that means here in just a little bit. But he mentioned here in this article, he mentioned Sufism. Now, a couple years ago, I didn't know what that was. But Sufism is a branch of Islam. It is a sort of a mystical Islam. It is Islamic mysticism is what it is. And here is how Sufism is described. Prayer, in the form of constant repetition of the various names for the divine, is the chief Sufi tool for such growth. This skill is first developed with the help of a rosary, but after time it can become an integrated part of one's mental activities. So, regardless of one's activities, silent prayer can take place. Further techniques, including fasting, a 40-day retreat at some point is not uncommon. I'll stop right here. Those of you who have heard of Ramadan, which is this uh, Islamic festival where they fast 40 days, that's part of it. And I will tell you, and I'm going to go ahead and inject this in this, can you think of a guy, a, Christ, a so-called Christian guy, who is promoting 40 days of something, 40 days of purpose? We're going to get to him in just a little bit. This is where it all comes from. A 40-day retreat at some point is not uncommon. And the use of music and movement to induce blissful, trance-like, God-intoxicated states. Now remember that we talked about the wine of Sodom being the poison of dragons. And I want you to think about things that are intoxicating or the state of inebriation because we're going to see it here in just a little bit. Quoting a short biography by Carolyn T. Marshall on the life of St. Teresa of Avila, who was one of these promoters of contemplative prayer, it says, After a long, prolonged sickness that almost led to her death, Teresa was introduced to the third spiritual primer by Francisco de Osura, a Franciscan. De Osura followed a tradition of Christian mysticism that had been deeply influenced by the Sufi mystics of Islam. In this system, emphasis is placed on prayer in which the worshiper detaches himself from everything except God. A sort of spiritual intuition, remember that word, which is combined from memory, will, and understanding enables the supplicant to receive a direct experience of God who then illumines the soul with knowledge of himself. And basically, this is saying that Teresa of Avila was introduced to contemplative prayer by way of of the mysticism of Islam, which is Sufism, the godlike intoxication. 
Now, back to the mystic encyclopedia. Remember, they talked about God is a great underground river. You know, several years ago when I was researching Dan Brown's uh, The Da Vinci Code and researching all of the background material that went into that, I discovered that a, a common element in all of the occult sciences or the occult religions is a belief in what's called Arcadia. Arcadia, they say, is an underground stream. Now, I want you to think of something for a minute. I want to show you this in the Bible. Where is God right now, according to the Bible? He's not underground. He is, he is up in heaven. He is up high. Can you think of somebody right now that is underground, characterized by a river? There was a rock group several years ago called Styx. Nobody knew what the name of that was. The word Styx was the Greek term for this underground river that flowed through hell. And so I want you to begin to get this concept that they said that God is an underground river and all of these religions are wells from which this stream comes forth into people's lives. Think about the setup and think about where we're going this. Now, it goes on to say, connect, to connect with the great river of mysticism, we all need a path. But when you get down there, there's only one river. What I'm doing is connected with the East. I have a Hindu from India teaching Shakta Yogi in my program. We teach Tai Chi and Aikido. We have Sufis, Buddhists, Jews, Catholics, and Protestants, and witches. So the future of religion is interdenomination. And remember, they're teaching this Arcadia, this grand underground stream. And I'm going to show you what that stream is that all of these wells of all these different religions are tapping into and up rising up from this underground stream is this new God. It's the God of the new age. It's the Antichrist. Masonic author Manly P. Hall said, many ancient mystical traditions speak of a God who was cast into a river and is awaiting the day when he will rise from the river. These gods, he says, were all worshiped with the wine of ecstasy. Think of that wine again and think of drunken states. Manly Hall goes on to say the Egyptians also believed that Osiris, which is the, the sun god, was the river Nile. Now Osiris in the mystery languages is none other than the beast, the antichrist, the one who rises from the sea. Ezekiel chapter 29 verse 3 says, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh king of Egypt, who is a type of the Antichrist, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers. So get this concept, this underground stream that all of these religions of mysticism is talking about is none other than the beast himself who is underground, who is going to rise up one of these days. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So now we're seeing a connection here. Contemplative prayer is nothing more than a setup to get church people into accepting 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the mystery of iniquity, that the, the, that the Apostle Paul was referring to. Now we're going to look at some of the promoters of contemplative prayer, and your eyes are going to shoot right out of your head. You're going to see something that you've never seen before. You're going to see some people promoting this deadly, dangerous practice, people that you probably prayed for, listened to, followed, sent money to. You're going to see some of these people. Now again, this list comes from Lighthouse Trails Research. You can go to their website. I hardly recommend them as, as, as far as a source of contemplative prayer. You have names like Elise Bailey, an occultist, founded the Arcane School. Ken Blanchard, founder of Ken Blanchard Companies and Lead Like Jesus Leadership Conferences. You know, that sounds Christian. Brother Lawrence, a, a practicing monk. Jack Canfield, creator and author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Larry Crabb, Christian clinical psychologist. Uh, Tilden Edwards, founder of the Shalem Prayer Institute. Richard Foster, Quaker and founder of Renovare. Matthew Fox, former Dominican priest. Thomas Keating, a Catholic monk. Dan Kimball, author of The Emerging Church. Brennan Manning, former Catholic priest. Barbara Marks Hubbard, an influential New Ager. 
Brian McLaren, who is one of the leading names in the emerging church movement, is a pusher of contemplative prayer, and he practices it himself. Thomas Merton, now deceased Roman Catholic monk. Henry Nowen, deceased Catholic theologian. M. Scott Peck, psychiatrist and author of The Road Less Traveled. Robert Schuller, pastor of Crystal Cathedral. Agnes Sanford, author of Healing Light. William Shannon, New Age biographer. Wayne Teasdale, coined the term inner spirituality. Teresa of Avila, we talked about her earlier, Catholic nun. Evelyn Underhill, Roman Catholic author of Mysticism. Neil Donald Walsh, author of Conversations with God. Rick Warren, pastor and author of The Purpose Driven Life. Marianne Williamson contributed to Making a Course in Miracles. Mike Iaconelli, late founder and owner of Youth Specialties. Mark Iaconelli, son of the late Mike Iaconelli, very active in the contemplative prayer movement. Henry Blackaby, author of Experiencing God. Bill Hybels, pastor of Willow Creek Community Church. David Jeremiah, pastor of Turning Point Ministries, author of Life Wide Open. He was a speaker at Ken Blanchard's Lead Like Jesus Seminars and American Association of Christian Counselors. He is openly endorsing contemplative prayer. Max Lucado, you've heard of him, Sue Monk Kid. Uh, Beth Moore, founder of Living Proof Ministries for what for women. Watchman Nee, mystic author of The Spiritual Man. John Ortberg, Eugene Peterson, author of The Message Bible. And I submit to you, if you've ever read The Message or seen our videos on them, you will know that The Message is none other than a New Age version of the Bible. And I believe that Eugene Peterson contemplative prayered familiar spirits into his life that led him to translate the Bible in this way. Uh, Peter Singh, a Buddhist, author and founder of Society for Organizational Learning, a New Age movement. Michael W. Smith, promoter of Brandon Manning's book, Above All. Charles Stanley, Southern Baptist evangelical pastor, author of How to Listen to God. He espouses the belief that God continues to speak to man today outside of his word. In the 993 In Touch magazine, Stanley quotes favorably from mystic Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of discipline. Andy Stanley, pastor, spoke at Kim Blanchard's Lead Like Jesus conference in 2005. Chuck Swindoll, evangelical pastor of Insight for Living, author of So You Want to Be Like Christ, Eight Essential Tools to Get You There, a book on the solitude and silence of contemplative prayer. John Michael Talbot, a Christian musician who's also a Roman Catholic monk. And the list goes on and on and on. And I'm telling you, if you'll just start watching for some of these people, eventually, it's going to, they're going to come out of the closet in endorsing contemplative prayer. There was a video that circulated. You can still buy new copies of it called Be Still and Know That I'm God. Remember that phrase. Remember what we said about it earlier. This video endorsed by Henry Cloud, Richard Foster, Max Lucado, Beth Moore, and scores of others did nothing but promote this stillness prayer, this silence prayer, contemplative mystic Christianity in video form, which everybody, you know, when you use videos, you, you reach a lot of people, and that's exactly what has happened. And now we have thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of church members all across the country promoting contemplative prayer. Another organization, Youth Specialties, owned by Zondervan, you, through Youth Specialties, and many other youth-oriented organizations, our youth are being taught to treat the Bible as a meditative vehicle rather than a source of knowledge to further our understanding of God. In their magazine called Esoteric, which I'm going to stop right here. The word esoteric, you know what that means? Secret knowledge. Their magazine actually is called Esoteric, a book of secret knowledge. In one of their articles, they, they had an article called Teaching Dreaming Language to Young People. And the article goes on to say, one way to help your students rehear a passage is to use an imaginative prayer exercise. It allows students the chance to imagine themselves inside biblical narratives as characters or witnesses to the story in order to help them think through and experience the stories of, and, of scriptures and God's role in these stories. And they go on to say, we want to help you open your students up to a new encounter with God's Word. So here you'll find a free exercise from Imaginative Prayer for Youth Ministry. And all the youth groups, and these youth groups now in churches are huge. It's a youth, this is a huge ministry, a multi-billion dollar ministry, uh, industry in this country. And going into the youth groups, through the youth pastors, through the literature, 
and churches all across this world, they're teaching them New Age Christian mystical practices where young people, and you're going to see this in a minute, they're not hearing the voice of God. They're hearing a different voice of a different God, and I'm going to show you that from the pages of the Bible. One of the main writers, as we mentioned earlier, for U Specialties is Mark Iaconelli, and he's a regular featured speaker at U Specialties National, National Youth Workers Conventions, and he actually wrote the book on contemplative youth ministry. Here is what one of the authors of From Youth Specialties wrote concerning their own prayer practice. He was teaching in a seminar, and he was asked the question, you're going to teach us to meditate? That's right, I said. Isn't that New Age or Buddhist, she asked? Well, Buddhists do meditate, and there are many New Age meditative prayer practices, but what I'm going to teach is Christian meditation. I silently promised myself never to use the word meditation in a public Christian setting ever again. What's the difference, she asked. Well, on the surface, nothing. The approach to meditation for a Buddhist looks an awful lot like what I do. The difference is the reason we're doing it. The Buddhist empties the mind for the sake of emptying it. The Christian empties the mind to fill it with Christ. He later goes on to write about his inward journey. He said, therefore, I was largely alone in my explorations. I was tired of debates with classmates who accused the disciplines of being occult practices, so I started using the phrase listening prayer when I talked about my own experiences in meditation. I built myself a prayer room, a tiny sanctuary in a basement closet filled with books on spiritual disciplines, contemplative prayer, and Christian mysticism. In that space, I lit candles, burned incense, hung rosaries, and listened to tapes of Benedictine monks. I meditated for hours on words, images, and sounds. I reached the point of being able to achieve alpha brain patterns. I'm going to show you what that is in a little bit. You, you just, you're going to flip out. The state in which dreams occur while still awake and meditating. I made many journal entries of my prayers, thoughts, and dreams. Now, I want you to get this. Here is one of the editors, writers for one of the leading youth ministry publishing companies in the world. And he just revealed to us that he goes into a little place, he lights candles, he hears Benedictine monks chant, he chants, he goes into an alpha state, an altered state of consciousness. He practices what everybody in the New Age practices, transcendental meditation. He practices that, and then he writes down his insights, and I promise you those insights are being fused into the curriculum of what's ending up in our Sunday school rooms, our vacation Bible schools, our Bible commentaries, these people are standing, behind, are standing behind and influencing the people that are standing behind the pulpits. And I'm telling you, they're not hearing from the Holy Ghost of God. They're hearing from some other spirit. Nav Press came out several years ago with a magazine called Pray Kids, Adventures with Jesus in Prayer, promoting contemplative prayer, calling it going to the next level. In this, now this is for children. In this article, they quoted Brother Lawrence, who was a 17th century French monk who is best known for his example of the contemplative life. He practiced God's presence in every minute of his day while working as a monastery cook. The secrets of Brother Lawrence's devotion to God apparently lay in his hearty renunciation of anything that did not lead to God, his belief that God was the beginning and end of all his thoughts and desires, and his conviction that prayer was nothing more than, con than the continuing sense of God's presence. You Specialties also promotes what's called deep breathing, a practice used often in New Age meditation techniques, yoga, and hypnosis. Now, we mentioned Rick Warren a while ago. This is a direct quote from Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Church. Look at what he said. Many Christians use breath prayers throughout their day. You choose a brief sentence or a simple phrase that can be, here it is, repeated to Jesus in one breath. You are with me. I receive your grace. I'm depending on you. I want you. I belong to you. Rick Warren wrote something that is in direct contradiction to the Word of God, where Jesus told us to not use vain repetitions in our prayers. Rick Warren says, use these vain repetitions and pray them to Jesus. And in doing so, you will hear the voice of God on the inside of you. 
Moving into the churches across America, things like Lectio Divina, Logos Meditation, called Sacred Reading, a slow meditating on a portion of scripture without exegesis or analysis. In other words, without thinking. This is similar to a chant used in yoga. In fact, yoga is one of the fastest growing movements among these contemporary modern churches right now. All of these pastors, all these pastor's wives, all these youth groups, all these people are now having yoga sessions inside of the house of God. They are hearing from some other God other than Jesus Christ in their houses of worship. Let's learn a little bit about yoga. Here's the cover of a book that I have on Kundalini Yoga. Now I'm going to explain Kundalini here in a little bit. This is from the Divine Life Society and here is how they define yoga. The word yoga comes from the root yuj, which means to join and in its spiritual sense is that process by which the human spirit is brought into, near, and conscious communion with or is merged in the divine spirit. Now, here again, we go back to this well. And we have all of these religions tapping into this well, into this underground stream called Arcadia, which we now know is the stream or the river of the Antichrist. And he's saying that you become one with this divine spirit through the practice of Kundalini Yoga. Now let me explain a little bit about what Kundalini is. Kundalini is this, is this New Age Eastern mysticism concept that at the base of your spine, is a coiled up spirit. It's a serpent. And this serpent wants to rise up. Remember the dragon that's in the river coming up through these wells. That's the same symbolism. This spirit wants to rise up. This serpent wants to rise up the 33 bones of your spinal column and enter the pineal gland in your forehead, which is why you see all these Indian people with this little mark on their forehead. It represents the divine enlightenment of Kundalini or raising the serpent from the lower depths. And here's an image of it here from this book on Kundalini Yoga. This serpent is now in a deep well that's on fire. This is the Antichrist and Kundalini Yoga, hence yoga practices, hence mysticism, hence contemplative prayer, is all about raising up this beast that is in the fire, the pit, the well, the bottomless pit, the Bible calls it, the beast that is rising up out of the pit to bring him out to become the God of this world. That's what yoga is about. That's what the Eastern mysticism is about. And that is what contemplative prayer is all about. Now, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten corns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Revelation 17, 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And so scripturally, we understand now the truth or the mystery behind contemplative prayer. Now we mentioned earlier that Sufism and all these groups, they practice this contemplative prayer, this meditation, and it brings them into what's called a God intoxicated state. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're just going to take a little journey through scripture and we're going to let the descript, we're going to let the scriptures define for us the difference between soberness and intoxication or drunkenness. And I'm telling you, the Bible warns us specifically against being drunk, whether that's drunk physically or drunk spiritually. Notice what the Bible says, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, between unclean 
and clean. God is simply saying that if you're drunk, as the job of the priest, you're supposed to know the difference between a clean animal and an unclean animal. And God says, if you drink wine and strong drink, you will not know the difference. No wonder we're seeing the de-evolution of mankind through contemplative prayer, through drunken states that are coming out of our pulpits and out of our church members, because people are no longer able to tell what's right and what's wrong. That's why we have sodomy going on everywhere in churches all across America, and it's being accepted now. Why? Because of the intoxicating spirits that are flowing through our churches. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The Bible's telling you that wine and this spirit is a deceiving spirit. And instead of bringing wisdom, it'll bring foolishness. Proverbs chapter 23, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth how? Like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. That's mystery Babylon the great. And thine heart shall utter perverse things. So here again we're seeing the association of wine and strong drink with a change in the doctrines of the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. God is showing you opposites here. He's not saying they're the same. He's showing you opposites. The wine of this world, the, wine, the vine of Sodom, will bring you into drunkenness, an altered state of consciousness. The wine of the Holy Spirit of God will cause you to stand and be sober and rational in your thinking. Let's look at the word sober in the scriptures. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. The word sober is from a Latin word sobrius, which means without inebriation or without drunkenness. And notice that God tells us to think, to think soberly to not empty our mind, to not have all of our rational thoughts evacuated out, to not just be a total void in our brain. He tells us as born-again Christians, being filled with the Spirit, to think soberly. First Thessalonians chapter 5, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for, you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the night. Notice the contrast here. Sleep happens at night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 57 says, And I will make her drunk, I will make drunk her princes, he's speaking of Babylon, and her wise men, her captains, and her rulers, her mighty men, and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake. Now, I want you to think about this because the Bible is teaching you what psychiatrists already know, that when you lower the brainwave patterns, and we're going to see this, when you lower the level of your, of your critical thinking in your mind, you tend to go to sleep. They say hypnosis is sort of like a sleep, but it's not quite a sleep. So is alpha brain patterns that we talked about or this trance that, med that contemplative prayer brings you into, and the Bible equates it with drunkenness. First Timothy says that a bishop must be sober. He said their wives must be sober. Titus 2 says that the aged men must be sober. The aged women likewise be sober so they can teach the young women to be sober. He says that the young men likewise exhort to be sober minded. In other words, everybody in the church is to be sober minded, not drunk. You will never, ever, ever see in the pages of the Bible a commandment from God an imploration from God for us to be drunk. Never. God tells us to be sober. He tells us in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. He says in 1 Peter, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. I'm going to stop right here. You think about what he's saying here. Gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, 
have it together. Have it together. Be able to think right. You know, one of the greatest gifts that God has given us as human beings is the ability to think rationally, to think logically, to have our mind working in a proper manner, to be able to be taught things and learn things and read and see the world around us and have understanding. That is the greatest thing. And it comes through girding up the loins of your mind, just as, just as someone who is physically drunk would be loose in their actions, loose in their words, loose in the morality. So someone who is drunk spiritually have that same looseness as well. And God said, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. First Peter 4, 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. And watch this now and watch unto prayer. He's connecting it here for us. He's telling us that sobriety is the way that we should pray. The opposite of this commandment of Scripture is to pray in a drunken state. That is exactly what contemplative prayer is all about. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, here it is. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible's trying to tell you that the reason why you should be sober is so that you can tell that there is a lion waiting around the corner, waiting to devour you. So those who are slipping into an altered state of consciousness will never know who this lion really is. They'll be told that it's the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus. But it's not. It's the devil masquerading as Jesus Christ. This is the danger that the church is heading into right now. Now, I've mentioned so far, I've mentioned contemplative prayer, and it's been mentioned by those who practice contemplative prayer that contemplative prayer is like a form of hypnosis. And they mentioned what was called the alpha state of consciousness. Now, I found this on a website, interestingly enough, for children, a website for kids. It was called Hypnosis for Kids, the school for wizards. And in this, there's an explanation and at what I believe to be an accurate representation of brain waves. And so here you have brain waves. The brain wave frequency called the beta frequency operates at 14 to 40 CPS. That state of conscious is regarded as fully awake and alert, which would be sobriety generally associated with left brain thinking activity, a conscious mind. Now, I'm going to show you the left brain, right brain here. Just I have a really neat graphic I want to show you on this, okay? So anyway, the normal state that, that, let's say that I'm in right now or you're in watching this, watching this video, is a beta state. Your, your left brain, which controls the critical logical thinking processes of your mind, they're working. Okay, they're working. I'll show you the graphic here in a little bit. Everything's working the way it should. And, you know, we, 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 we hear things. We are conscious of the world around us. We're thinking critically. We're being helped by the right brain or the right side of our brain, which has to do with creativity, imagination, things like that. And both of them work beautifully well together. God's given us a, a great, wonderful mind. But generally, when we're fully conscious and fully awake, the left brain is in charge. It's in control. So we make rational deliberate decisions on the things that we're going to do. When we're driving cars, we need to have the left brain working pretty well, all right? So that's the beta uh, frequency. The alpha frequency slows down. The brain is slowing down. It's called relaxed, daydreaming, generally associated with right brain thinking activity. Subconscious mind, a key state for relaxation. Anybody that has led you into a relaxation technique or relaxation this or that and the other, they're slowing the brain down. The theta frequency, deeply relaxed, dreaming. Remember what he said a while ago about dreaming while he was awake. Dreaming, generally associated with right brain thinking activity, deeper subconscious to superconscious, access to insights, burst of creative ideas, a key state for reality creation through vivid imagery. This is new age stuff here. Then the delta. The delta symbol is a triangle. The delta symbol itself is a symbol for transformation. 
Delta brain waves are very, very slow, almost non-moving. Generally associated with no thinking, unconscious, superconscious, access to non-physical states of existence, a key state for healing, regeneration, and rejuvenation. Deep, deep sleep is what it's all about. Now, I love this graphic. This graphic perfectly illustrates the hemispheres of the human brain. God designed a wonderful thing here. On the left side, the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. The left side of your brain controls logical, critical thinking skills visualized by people sitting, working on computers, writing computer programs, logic, and things like that. Accessing files, as it were. When someone asks you a question and you're required to give a truthful answer, you have all these guys in the cubicles accessing files. So you're looking through files of information so you can give an accurate response to that. That is the left side of your brain. It sees everything as black and white, either on or off, right or wrong. That's how it is. Now, God has given us another side to our brain because God's a good God to us. We're not just like Vulcans on Star Trek, just making logical responses to everything. We have a creative side. We have a, uh, a, an emotional side, a feeling side. So notice the graphic again. Um, the artistic nature of mankind comes out, whether he's drawing or doing music or he's going through a walk of the woods or he's just musing on different things. This is the creative side of our brain. Now, if you'll allow me to use this illustration, we have in us a male side and a female side. Men generally tend to think more logically. Women generally tend to think more creatively, although they do both, because God gave us these two wonderful parts of our brain that are meant to work together. And the scripture says, can two walk together except they be agreed? But as in the case of scripture, in a marriage, only one can be in charge, the male, the man. Now I'm gonna show you where I'm going with this here in a minute. You're gonna see the glory of God in activity inside of our very bodies, inside of our brain. But God didn't just put man on the earth. Remember God said it is not good that the man should be alone. I will give him a help meet for him. And so God gave man the woman. And in a beautiful godly marriage, the man is aided by the counsel and advice and the wisdom that God gives to the woman. I in my life rely upon the counsel given to me by my wife who prays God if I'm to lead my husband and counsel him wisely, help me do it in a godly manner. And God has blessed our marriage now almost 23 years, and God has worked that way inside of our marriage. We have been taught to accept the world's way that feminism has brought into us, but God has a wonderful way here. And I want you to think now, if you were flying in an airplane, would you want a pilot that wants to land the plane anywhere or a pilot that wants to land on the, on the only place reasonable to land, the runway. Now, I'll also tell you how also this works. We had this guy, Captain Sullenberger, who flew this airplane. When, they, when all the airplane's engines went out here in New York City, you saw this on the news. Instantly, his logical thinking was they were trying to get him to land at a runway somewhere. He couldn't do it. The creative side of his brain began to work along with the logical part of his brain and instead of landing in an airstrip the way he should have, he landed in a river. And yet in doing so, the creative side of his brain working with the logical side of his brain saved the lives of everybody on that plane. This is how it's designed to work. Now I'm going to show you this. This is a rock. This is the image of the left side of our brain. It's static. It sees everything. It is unchangeable. This is an image of God the Father. For God said, for I am the Lord, I change not. Now, this is clay. Clay is intended to be movable or you're to, intended to create things with it. And clay is figured as a woman, a female. And in the book of Proverbs, she is the strange woman. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. God said, Matthew 7, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. That's the straight and narrow way. That's the logical part, the male. Again, 
we see that contemplative prayer practices often use a maze or a labyrinth which represents her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. And so in this graphic here, we have the static Word of God represented by God the Father, which is the logical part. And yet when a spirit of Babylon, the harlot, rules over life or rules over a country, or rules over a church, churches then are led by feelings, emotions, imagination, and intuition. And remember, all of these other altered states involved the right side of the brain, which is the imaginative or the intuitive side of the brain, leaving the logical, critical thinking skills completely out. Now, getting back into these altered states of consciousness, you know, you have the uh, alpha state and you have the theta state and the delta state. I'm telling you that once you get into the alpha state, the goal is to reduce your brain activity even further, lulling you into a subconscious or unconscious deep, deep sleep that the Bible calls drunkenness. Here is what is said amongst the proponents of contemplative prayer, the mystics, the New Agers, and even the witch concerning the alpha state. Mystical states of consciousness happen in the alpha state. The alpha state also occurs voluntarily during light hypnosis, meditation, biofeedback, daydreaming, hypnagogic, and hypnopompic states. It is my belief that all information comes to us in alpha because all information in the universe consists of light energy. Light enters the pineal gland or third eye, remember that, located in the center of the head between the eyebrows, where many psychics say they experience physical sensations when they receive extrasensory information. That was written by Lori Cabot who wrote The Power of the Witch. She also said alpha is the springboard for all psychic and magical workings. It is the heart of witchcraft. She goes on to say the science of witchcraft is based upon our ability to enter altered states of consciousness we call alpha. This is a state associated with relaxation, meditation, and dreaming. In alpha, the mind opens up to non-ordinary forms of communication. Get that. Here we also experience out-of-body sensations and psychokinesis and receive mystical, visionary information. Richard Foster said in the Celebration of Discipline, if you feel we live in a purely physical universe, you will view meditation as a good way to obtain a consistent alpha brainwave pattern. One website said it should be noted that these studies represent the very best results that can be expected from the classical meditative disciplines as these individuals were totally immersed in the contemplative lifestyle. These individuals consistently produced mid to high frequency alpha waves. Lance Witt, who is a pastor at Saddleback Community Church, said this, the goal of solitude is not so much to unplug from my crazy world as it is, look at what he says, to change frequencies so that I can hear the Father. Richard Foster has said, solitude doesn't give us the power to win the rat race, but to ignore it altogether. The following is from a website, chromisticaloutreach.com, promoting mystical contemplation methods such as mantra-like prayers. It is a question from someone having doubts about the mystical path. The question, Thank you so much for answering my email so promptly. One more question I would ask of you. Ever since this started in 1991, I have felt as if I'm now sharing my physical body with someone else. I can actually feel it. Sometimes it feels like hands inside of me, sometimes like a snake, sometimes like an animal or insect. It only stops when I'm asleep. It scares me so much that at times I think it must be a demon or evil spirit. Other times I think it is part of the dark night of the soul. Remember that? Can you enlighten me on this matter? Thank you. Here's the answer that this New Ager wrote. Every single thing you have mentioned over the years I have felt. Feel blessed, not cursed or possessed. It is the Holy Spirit flowing through your nervous system. It sometimes takes a long time to become accustomed to the flowing of it. When you, when you hear some of these uh, people in the uh, New Age charismatic movement talking about the flow, the flow, the flow, remember that underground river, the flow. This is demonic activity, folks, flowing through them. This is what they want to give you an impartation of. 
It sometimes takes a long time to become accustomed to the flowing of it. Have you ever gotten a spider web caught in your face and your whole face feels creepy and tingly? It's like that. Your nerves have a reaction to the sensation of the web against your face. Same thing with the flowing of the Spirit. As the Spirit opens up new pathways within you, you are going to feel movements of energy throughout your nervous system exactly as you described. It is a good sign that the Spirit is continuing to work with you. Be grateful whenever the Spirit works with you. It is a blessing. Yours in the Spirit, even when it feels creepy. Now, what I'm going to bring you to now is the association of contemplative prayer with demonic possession or what the Bible refers to as familiar spirits. This website called the Center for Contemplative Mind in Society actually has a, a graphic of a tree of contemplative practice. All of these different ways of getting in touch with familiar spirits, silence, centering prayer, insight meditation, sitting meditation, uh, you have ritual cyclical practices such as vision quest or sweat lodge or building an altar or a sacred space. I mean, many, many, many ways of practicing or getting in touch with these familiar spirits. One website called the Universal Gnostic Fellowship has an article that called Working with Your Spirit Guides. They say, if you do not already know your spirit guides, we recommend you start speaking to them. The basic way of doing this is through meditation and listening to your intuitive insights. Remember, that is the, the side of your brain that deals with creativity, Mystery Babylon the Great. Meditation is a process of moving your consciousness into higher planes while remaining in the physical plane. There are several meditative techniques. The Universal Gnostic Church teaches three excellent techniques for those who want to work with their spirit guides. Essene Healing Breath Meditation, Kriya Power Meditation, and Contemplative Meditation. If you already know who your spirit guides are, we recommend you work with them on a regular basis. You can do that through channeling, visualization and ritual, divination, and prayer. Channeling is a process of recording or repeating out loud for others what your spirit guides tell you. Now, I'm going to stop right here because remember, a lot of these contemplative prayer proponents inside the church say that they have a habit, a regular habit, of once they hear this voice, they start journaling or writing down what it is. This is the New Age occult practice of channeling people. This is what's going on inside of the church. So you can imagine that a lot of the sermons that's being preached, a lot of the lessons that are being taught, a lot of the movements that are being made, a lot of the things that are being written down in books, literature, Bibles, you name it, is being channeled by familiar spirits. Channeling is a process of recording or repeating out loud for others what your spirit guides tell you or show you. You can do this by writing it all down or by recording it with an electronic device. You may also do it by repeating what is said in a private session to a large group. You may allow your spirit guides to bring other disincarnate people to deliver messages to you. When you channel, you're working with spirit guides. Praying with your spirit guides is an excellent way to develop a closer relationship with them. The Universal Gnostic Church recommends intentional prayer and contemplative prayer for that purpose. Folks, I hope I'm scaring you. I hope that the information that I'm giving you today, if you've ever considered getting into this, if you know of someone that is doing this or their church is starting to promote it, give them this video or warn them somehow, some way of the dangerous practices that they're headed into. Folks, they are, they are about to be infilled with demon spirits in their soul. Look at what the Bible says about these familiar spirits and how they work. First Chronicles chapter 10, the Bible says, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord. Remember, that's the Bible. That is the opposite of contemplative prayer, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Now, I want to stop right here, and I want you to get this. Saul, at one time, was God's man. We know that to be a fact from Scripture. What happened? He rejected the word of Samuel, thus rejecting the word of God, 
and in replacement, rather than on this battle that he was going to, rather than consulting the word of God, he went to the witch of Endor who contacted a familiar spirit. He rejected the word and his replacement was a familiar spirit. And for that, God killed him. God allowed him to die because of his transgression. And I'm telling you, the death of the church is near because of contemplative prayer. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a-whoring after them. Remember, we'll stop right here again. The phrase a-whoring, mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots. Those words are the same. They're identical in their idea and their nature because familiar spirits are being brought about by mystery Babylon the great, mysticism, mystery ideas, contemplative prayer. The soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. God said, I will not tolerate it among my people and I will cut them off. Friends, I'm telling you, a great falling away is taking place right now and God, as the faithful shepherd, is separating the sheep from the goats right now by way of contemplative prayer. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And we can expect a time in this world when massive amounts of churches, churches, at one time fundamental Bible-believing churches, were going to depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits. How is this working? How does the devil get such and such church in such and such town, a pillar of the community, preachers, a church that once preached righteousness and holiness and consistent Christian living and the blood of Jesus Christ by the word of God and the supremacy of the word of God, churches that used to preach those things. How is the transformation taking place? Well, it starts with the churches getting hooked into the system through publishing companies, radio and TV ministries, Nav Press, Group Publishing, Thomas Nelson, Zondervan, Youth Specialties, David C. Cook, Randall House, all of these are in one way or another promoting spiritual formation and contemplative prayer. They're writing the literature. The churches are buying the literature. They're teaching the literature in the classes. That's stage one. These publishing houses have been influenced by guys like Tony Jones, Brian McLaren, and Rick Warren. These are, the, these are the money guys. These are the guys, the movers and shakers in this whole church transformation scenario that we're laying out for you. These are the guys that are saying, this is what needs to take place. The publishing companies are publishing what they're, written, what they're writing, being led by these guys, and pushing it down into the churches. These guys, by their own admittance, were influenced by guys like Thomas Merton, Father Thomas Keating. Are you seeing a pattern emerging here? Father this, sister this, the nuns, the monks, the priests. They were all inspired and led by the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius de Loyola, who was a faithful servant of the Vatican. All of these roads people are leading back to the Vatican, which is the seat of authority of Mystery Babylon herself, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is the spirit that's bringing it in, that brought it into the Vatican, that pushed it out through the priests, that influenced the writers, that wrote the curriculum, that brought it into the church. And here we have churches accepting the curriculum and abandoning the Word of God. That is how it happened. Now I want you to notice Mystery Babylon has something in her hand. She has a cup. We're going to understand what that cup is. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk, that's an altered state of consciousness, with the wine of her fornication.
And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. We're going to look at that cup. Full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. All throughout history, this woman has been seen characterized holding a cup. This is from Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, showing a woman with a cup. Here's another one, a woman who is Mystery Babylon the Great holding the cup. She is the mother of the Roman Catholic Church system. Manley Hall said in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, referring to this cup and the Antichrist, he said that cup to the multitude exhibited him as the god of drunken revelry. And of such revelry in his orgies, no doubt there was abundance. But yet, after all, the cup was mainly a hieroglyphic and that of the name of the god. The name of a cup in the sacred language was Kus. And thus the cup in the hand of the youthful Bacchus, the son of Aethiops, showed that he was the young Cush, or the son of Cush, meaning Nimrod. A communion cup or chalice was used in several of the ancient mysteries, and the god Bacchus is frequently symbolized in the form of a vase, cup, or urn. Masonic author Albert Mackey equates the cup with the Holy Grail with the lost word of Freemasonry. So here again, the symbolism of this cup, this cup that Mystery Babylon holds, this cup that makes all of the nations drunk, this cup that is making all of the contemplative prayers drunk into an altered state of consciousness, this cup is the symbol for the Antichrist. The drunkenness that is being brought into the churches now is nothing more than the drunkenness being brought on by the spirit of Antichrist that is working in our churches right now. This practice in these churches will undoubtedly lead to the rise, the emerging of the beast and the beast system in the last days. Now, God tells us and warns us about this cup. There is a cup in Christianity it is the cup of the blood of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It is salvation by grace through faith brought to us by the cross of Jesus Christ. We memorialize the death and the suffering of Jesus Christ when we have our tradition of communion inside of our churches biblically based. Non-intoxicating, non-drunken communion in the church of Jesus Christ. But there is another cup a cup that makes people drunk, a cup that brings people into fellowship, not with the real Jesus, but with another Jesus, the spirit of Antichrist himself coming in the last days. Of this, Paul warned us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Very clearly, God says you cannot have both ways. You're either going to be one or the other. God rejected Saul. He didn't say, Saul, you can still be mine even though you sought after familiar spirits. God rejected him as God does reject everyone who chooses to follow after the doctrines of devils and the seducing spirits, the demons that are contacted by way of contemplative prayer. Now, some might say, well, <clears throat> how, how then do you define prayer? Prayer is asking God things. How then do we hear God? We hear God not through hearing this inner voice on this inside of us, which we cannot trust. We hear God simply through the pages of our holy Bibles. Here's what God said in Deuteronomy chapter 31. When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. God is heard by way of hearing his word. Remember what Paul said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When they tell you that you can hear God by going into this meditative trance and this intuition coming out, I've even heard some of these ministers ask God, God help us to intuit your voice. 
they're not wanting to hear God from the Bible. They're wanting to hear from the God that's rising up, emerging on the inside of them. And again, Amos chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9, spells it out very clearly. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. God is warning us that those who have turned their backs upon the Bible and refuse to hear the Word of God written in the pages of their pure Word of God, God says their prayers shall be turned into abominations. This is exactly what we're seeing. Now I want to show you one more verse on sobriety and the warning that we have. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. My friend, don't let anybody tell you to empty your mind. Don't let anybody convince you that prayer must be done in a meditative form. And you say, well, what about meditation? The Bible talks about meditation. Yes, the Bible says think on these things. It gives you a list. The Bible says meditate on the scriptures, not repeat them in a mantra. There is a difference. There is a difference between filling your mind with the pages of the Word of God and thinking rationally on them and emptying your mind completely of all things. Therein lies the difference. And the command to us who are living in the last days, who know and believe this Bible, is to watch unto prayer and be sober. That is the job of watchmen. We watch, we see things, we're alert, we're conscious. You don't want a watchman on the wall who's asleep, do you? You want someone who is alert and conscious and able to spot the enemy wherever they crouch and lie in wait. The other job of the watchman to blow the trumpet and to warn. That's the purpose of this video. Most of you who watch this are already in agreement, saying, yes, we do not practice it, and we want to be warned about it. But you might know somebody that goes to a church, somebody that may already be practicing this or is on their way to. You need to warn them. You need to warn them before it's too late think on these things, pray about these things, warn people about these things, and let's stand as watchmen in the last days. This is Pastor Mike. I hope you've enjoyed this. Share it with others. Bye-bye.